Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Welcome. Good afternoon, Bremen. Um, I'm going to present joint work with uh, Professor Juliane Jacke, who, you, who you've met today at the keynote. We're both at the Center for Media, Communication and Information Research and the Institute for Information Management, Bremen. This used to be called democratization, but we found the public availability of machine learning and its harmful secondary effects to be more fitting. Let's talk about our motivating example. It's a case study on the limitations of machine learning. And as many of you know, Amazon loves automation. So they built a machine learning system that can review job applications. And the aim here was to mechanize the search for top talent. But the system they built showed the bias against women. They found that the system was not rating candidates for software developer jobs and other technical posts in a gender, gender neutral way. Um, but was biased against women. And this, um, and, and this is problematic, and we think it's going to increase in the upcoming year, because AI tools are becoming publicly available through open source software libraries. So we can expect more and more such systems in the future. And if we look at hiring in particular, 55% of US human research, manage, human research managers think they will use artificial in, uh, intelligence tools in the future, according to a survey by CareerBuilder. And of course, such a bias is not the first time, it didn't, it didn't happen the first time, right? And this bias is not a problem unique to hiring algorithms and machine learning. And of course, I'm preaching a bit to the choir here in a session on feminist approaches to data insecurities. But for instance, the book Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez has many examples of data biases in a world designed for men. And they can be super scary. If we look at crash test dummies, for instance, they're based on the median male or used to be based on the median male. It wasn't until 2011 that the US started using a female trash, crash test dummy. And the situation is even worse for pregnant women. But going back to our bias in hiring, I'd like to explain a bit how this happened. This is a simplified model of a machine learning algorithm. And like any algorithm, it has some input. In this case, this would be the CVs and the cover letters of the applicants. Then it manipulates it in some way and then it generates some output. In this case, it would be a decision. Invite this person for a job interview or not. In the Amazon example, these are the decisions that are made. We invite the men, we do not invite the women. Why? Because the system inferred from the data that male candidates were prefer preferable. So they penalized resumes that included the word women. For instance, if somebody wrote, she was in the women's chess club, then this was downgraded. Or if she went to an all-women's college. How did that happen? Well, it's a bias in the input data. So this is the input data that they trained the system with. And they had some examples of people they invited and some examples of people they didn't invite. And it was only men. And Sandra Wachter from Oxford describes this as you ask the question, who has been the most successful candidate in the past, and the common trait will be somebody that is more likely to be a man and white. And this shows how AI can actually reinforce existing stereotypes that we have in our society. In this paper, in this upcoming paper, we argue that those who train a machine learning hiring system blindly assume trust in the system to make informed recommendations based on a translation process of individual decisions of the past into a statistical model of apparent objectivity. So once more with dramatic effect, machine learning is acting as a black box that gives power to data. This is building on a notion of translation by Callan 1984 and Latour 2007. And it's basically in the spirit that any translation always entails betrayal. This is law 1990. And we argue that the availability of machine learning leads to a redistribution of agency in socio-technical systems, which reinforces biased decision-making or introduces new biases. So in this upcoming paper, we will focus on two aspects that enable this process. One is public availability. The other one is universal applicability. In this paper, we start with public availability. 
Because the training, as I said before, is becoming increasingly easy. Meanwhile, the rigorous evaluation of such systems remains challenging. So the easier these tools can be used, and the more accessible they become to people, the more people without even basic statistical knowledge will use them. And to prove my point, I'm going to teach you here now to develop a fully functioning job application classification system, just like the one that we had with Amazon. We're going to talk a bit about tutorials in the second part, and this, what I'm going to show you, is now really in the fashion of the tutorials that we looked at. These are like step-by-step -step guides on how to train a machine learning system. So, as we said, these are Python programming libraries that we're just loading. And then we have our data, and these are decisions of the past. These are hiring decisions. So these are the cover letters on the one hand, and these are did we invite them or not, or did we hire them or not. And here we split it into these two parts. One is the X, these are the cover letters that we're making the decision with, and the other ones are the Ys. So one part of the data is the features, the other one is the targets. And we split that into a test training split that's very common in machine learning instantiate a so-called support vector classifier. And in a way, this is really where the black box magic is happening. This is where we're training this machine learning system. This is where we're inferring decisions from data. And then we can evaluate this, and we get a score. And I can't stress this enough. This is working code. You can really, if you have Python installed on your computers, you can put it in there. You just need hiring decisions, and you can have a system with uh, that makes these decisions. And this is possible due to open source programming libraries like scikit-learn, which allow people to apply machine learning without a background in machine learning. And we argue, while open source is awesome and we're all for it, that this can also lead to harmful misapplications of such software. Next, we'd like to consider universal applicability. Because we can use this code, reuse this code, on other applications. So here, I don't know if we notice this, we replace the hiring decision.csv, put in spam.csv, and we have a spam classifier. And just highlighting how much we changed, we only really changed the data that we feed in. The same system could be used to build a system to make decisions about cars, right? This could be helpful for a car dealership, buy this car, don't buy this car. Or it could be used by doctors to detect cancer. And we're not the first to make this observation that machine learning is mixing all kinds of applications and that there's this idea of universal applicability. Adrian McKenzie, in his wonderful book, Machine Learners, has this table from one of the most important machine learning textbooks. And he basically looked at what are the data sets being used to train machine learning. And you can see this goes from the micro, like tissue cells with cancer, to all the way to the macro, to entire countries, the, even the galaxy, right? So all the same algorithms apply to everything without even thinking about the domain. We wanted to look a bit further into this, into more detail into this, and investigated how users are taught machine learning. Because machine learning, like most of computer science, is a discipline for autodidacts. People are used to teaching themselves, so people usually would look for a tutorial to learn how to do something. So that's also what we did. We looked at the top 50 Google search results for the query machine learning tutorials and analyzed the tutorials using an inductive data-driven approach following a systematic rule-bound procedure with categories akin to Meiring. Overall, we have two, almost 2,000 codes on average, 40 codes per tutorial from 4 to 140. So what are the tasks that are considered in these machine learning tutorials? Again, we have 50 machine learning tutorials, and it's really surprising, at least to us, that there's such a long tail of applications. There are five tutorials about advertising, where machine learning is used in advertising, two where it's applied in face detection, two on intelligent agents, and two on recommendations, but the 40 others um, are, have all almost unique tasks that they're looking at. And this can range from search engines to social media to traffic congestion. 
let's, before we look into our results, let's look at this bit more systematic model of machine learning that we developed. You might notice that there is a difference we make between the training data, the test data, and data in practice. And also notice that there's more than just the algorithm that I showed in the beginning. We also have a part on data, prepara pre data preparation and representation, and also a part on evaluation of the model. We also have the predictions and practice, which, which can be very different from what we have in our training. And we think that the main problems in the Amazon example, or in many other harmful applications of machine learning, that these problems were in the data preparation and the evaluation. For instance, with the data preparation, they might not have accounted for class imbalances. And this would be making sure that we have 50% female examples, 50% male examples in the training data. And this would have accounted or could have accounted for this effect. Another thing that they might have made wrong, didn't done wrong in these uh, examples, are evaluation problems that could be focusing too much on accuracy as an evaluation metric. There's, for instance, the confusion metrics that could be considered, or other metrics like precision and recall. And we now use these so-called Sankey diagrams as a visualization so you can follow how the different categories, how the different codes relate to the tutorials on the far right. So again, let's look at what algorithms are used, what algorithms are considered. Um, and this is one of four categories that we want to look at. Again, 50 machine learning tutorials that we coded, and we look at which algorithms are used, how is the data prepared, or is the tutorial talking about preparing data, and is the tutorial talking about evaluating the model, and is the significance of data discussed in the tutorial. And we have some surprisingly fi surprising findings, because more or, uh, often, more than one algorithm is discussed in the tutorials here on the top. So two to up to five or more, I think nine was the most, uh, algorithms are discussed in one individual tutorial. Even more surprisingly to us, there's also a good number, quite a lot, where no machine learning algorithm is mentioned in these machine learning tutorials. And we found that quite surprising. And as you can see, if you follow the different um, the different threads. Um, surprisingly few algorithms talk, uh, um, surprisingly few talk about algorithms and data preparation, and even less talk about model evaluation. If we zoom in on model evaluation, so now you can follow the colors for model evaluation, we find that only half of them discuss model, uh, uh, we, we, we find that only half of these that discuss model evaluation, that's the dark blue, actually consider data preparation. And we find that a very small proportion of these then also discusses the significance of data. And we were very surprised by this. Um, so you can see like, yeah, how, how, how few that is. Now if we now change our perspective again and we zoom in or center in on the significance of data, we find it surprising that a large fraction of those articles that discuss the significance, uh, uh, we find that the significance of data is rarely discussed in regards to specific algorithms and rather focused on articles that discuss two algorithms or that discuss more than five algorithms. This, this suggests that tutorials that discuss the significance of data in the context of actual algorithms is limited but we think that that is crucial and that it should be done. All this supports that data exercises agency through machine learning. And people without the proper training who increasingly employ and uh, develop these algorithms uh, need to be more aware of this. We also, the tutorials also show how people learn, uh, so, so we, our exam, like the results that we looked at show that uh, support uh, this thesis so that the people are only learning these step-by-step -step guides on building like one model and they're not learning about how to prepare the data properly. They're not learning on how to evaluate the, mod uh, the model properly and they don't think about the, the data and, it, 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 and its significance. And all this in our perspective or in our opinion leads to a power imbalance in favor of data. And with that I'd like to thank you.